Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Candace Tunis. I am an orthopedic hand surgeon. I work with UT. Uh, I mainly practice in Sugarland, and I'm going to talk to you guys tonight about injuries uh, that are common to the athlete around the hand and wrist. And I've titled it, Not Just a Sprain, because so many times I see people come in and they say, oh, I think I thought I just jammed it, or I thought I just sprained it. And, and often it is much, much more. So hopefully today you'll come away with a little bit of an understanding of some very basic hand anatomy um, and recognize some common sports injuries that happen around the hand and wrist and then know when to seek treatment from a specialist. So the anatomy of the hand is quite beautiful and complex. It's one of the things that I love most about it. Um, and it is, uh, there could be a lot to talk about, but we'll keep it simple. Um, there are a number of bones, obviously, in the, in the fingers and wrist. Uh, the joints are held in place by ligaments and those connect bones to bones. The tendons serve to move the joints and those attach muscles to bone. And then there are nerves, arteries, and veins, but those uh, are not really relevant for what we're going to talk about today. So we abbreviate the joints as follows. We have the MCP, and that is where the uh, finger joins the hand. We have the PIP, or the middle knuckle, and then we have the DIP, or the end knuckle. The uh, bones that comprise the finger are called the phalanges, or a phalanx if it's uh, singular. And then the uh, bones across the hand here are the metacarpals, and then the carpals here at the wrist, and then finally radius and ulna. So tendons, again, they serve to, to join the muscle to the bone and they help to move the joints. The flexor tendons are on the palm side and bend the fingers, while the extensor tendons are on the, uh, the back of the hand and serve to extend the fingers or straighten the fingers. So there are a lot of different types of fractures that can happen uh, around the hand. Some of them are little chip fractures or avulsion fractures. Uh, and may require a little more than buddy taping. And then some are more complicated fractures that may require a surgery. And here are a couple of clues that there may be a fracture after an injury. If there's real point tenderness over the bone specifically, especially if there is bruising, because when a bone breaks, the first thing it does is it bleeds. And so you'll get a bruise around the area. Um, if, if motion is really painful and very difficult, uh, that's another sign. And then also, uh, fractures can sometimes be quite subtle, like this one that's here on this uh, slide on the bottom right. It doesn't look like it's that bad, but that type of fracture at a joint can cause uh, a, lot of a, pro a lot of problems with joint motion and can also contribute to some malrotation. So it's important to look for little deformities and it's good that you can just compare it to the other side. Sometimes you won't notice uh, malrotation until you have someone start to bend the fingers. So if you have them start to bring the, the fingers down into a fist, they should all essentially point to the base of the palm. But uh, if you have a fracture that's got some, some rotational deformity in it, what can happen is that one finger can start to kind of overlap uh, over another or sort of um, come out to the side even. So those are just some things to look for uh, in evaluating for a fracture. Um, one of the most common tendon related injuries, and I diagnosed this uh, a ton while everyone was on quarantine. I think everyone was in the backyard throwing the football around or something. But anyway, when the fingertip uh, jams into something and the end knuckle gets forced down, what will happen is that the extensor tendon will pull off of the bone. Uh, it can occur with or without a fracture. And what will happen is that essentially the finger will be droopy. So you would just, no matter how hard you try, you can't pull the finger all the way up and it'll rest in that drooped position or flex position. So again, the, the tendon can pull off of the bone or it can even take a little piece of bone with it. The piece of bone can be quite tiny or it can be a larger fragment, which can actually affect the joint stability. So 90 plus percent of mallet fingers can be treated in a splint. Um, the issue with the splint is that you have to wear it 24 hours a day, seven days a week for usually six to eight weeks. Uh, you cannot uh, take the splint off to shower. You cannot let that joint droop or flex. Otherwise it starts the clock all over again. Uh, and you have to start all over. There's a number of different ways to splint it. You can use uh, basically a kind of a handmade aluminum splint where you just 
make a, you trim out the foam and you make sort of a hyperextended piece of aluminum on the back of the finger only holding this joint. Um, and then you tape the finger up to the splint and that gives a little bit of hyperextension into it. That works well, but you're dealing with several pieces of tape and sometimes it gets annoying. The off the shelf stack splints, I don't think, I think they're a little bit uh, one size fits like some people. So I don't like those as much. I do like the um, occupational therapy or hand therapy made custom made splints. I think those are the best ones and the easiest for patients to be compliant with. Um, but not every mallet finger gets a, a splint. You know, again, there are sometimes issues with compliance. It's really hard to have patients be 24 seven, you know, wearing a splint all the time. So some people opt to get the joint surgically pinned and then they don't have to be as religious about splinting. Um, and then two, if there's a fracture, so this is an example of one of my patients had a fairly big fracture and then that joint, the, the joint slides out of place and the joint becomes like a square peg in a round hole and is prone to get early arthritis. And in that case, it's worth getting the joint into a proper position and held there uh, to prevent that uh, from happening. Another, uh, another uh, fairly common sports-related tendon injury, and this is on the flexor tendon side, is called a jersey finger. So this uh, is also known as an FTP avulsion injury, and it'll happen because as if, if you have a finger hooked into a jersey, so you've got this flexion force that's going through the finger and then it gets jerked into extension, it'll pop that longer flexor tendon, the FDP, off of the end of the bone. Um, and when that tears off of the end of the bone, then it becomes not possible to bend the end knuckle. So this is how you isolate and test for FDP. So if somebody's had an injury, they've had an injury like that and they felt a pop or something and this, something feels not right, test them for a jersey finger. So you hold the, the, the knuckle, the middle knuckle straight and ask them to actively bend the end knuckle and they won't be able to do that. Most of the time it's the ring finger and it's so important not to miss these uh, because these all need surgery and they need surgery quickly because the tendon pulls back into either halfway down the finger or sometimes all the way into the palm. And if it sits there for a while, I can't get it all the way back out and it becomes not repairable. Um, and this is what they will look like in real life. And if you ask them to make a tight fist like this, they won't be able to do it. It'll come down like that. Or sometimes the finger will sit in a slightly kind of straighter posture than the others because of the lack of that natural pull of the flexor tendon. So again, the tendon that's been sucked back down in the finger at surgery, I pull it all the way back out through the pulley system. Uh, and then I reattach it to the bone using usually a combination of some suture anchors that help to uh, tie the tendon back down to the bone. And then I also use a stitch that gets weaved and tied on a, on a button over the top of the nail. And then the, these need a fair amount of rehab and protection after while they heal. Uh, it's worth spending some time on the PIP, this middle knuckle here. This is the most commonly injured knuckle and that is the, this is really your classic jammed finger. I see this all the time and it's really hard sometimes to know and you, really impossible to know just from looking at the finger. Oh, is it a sprain? Is there a fracture? Is, you know, uh, and, 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 and if, if you're really, if you're not able to easily move it quickly, and there's a lot of bruising, it's worth getting it checked at. And 100%, I can't emphasize this enough, if you pop something back in, if you um, if you reduce anything, you've got to get x-rays. Um, and again, the sprain is really the most common injury, and it's when you have, um, you'll have some tenderness over sometimes the side ligaments, often usually off over the volar plate, which is the, the really strong structure on the bottom of the knuckle that helps to support it. Because as the finger gets jammed, it gets hyperextended and those, those, the ligament here and on the sides gets either some degree of stretched or torn. Um, the issue with these is that they will stay tender and swollen for months. Um, and, uh, but once you've ruled out fracture or another kind of structural problem, it's really important not to splint these. These have got to get moving. And I see this frequently where patients will have an injury to the finger, they'll go to the urgent care, fracture will get ruled out, they'll say, oh, it's just a sprain, splint it. So they get put in this big giant aluminum splint and then uh, they get told to splint it for a few weeks and if you're still having problems, go see a hand surgeon. And then I see all those people because they come out of the splint and they go to move their finger and this is what they get. And it hurts and it's stiff and they think something's still wrong with it. And what's wrong is that everything's just gotten tight and then sometimes they need therapy at that point. So uh, as long as um, as there's no fracture or any other issue, it's really important to get these moving. So I recommend treating these with buddy tapes. 
and it basically allows you to use the neighboring finger like a splint, but still allow for motion. Um, and if, especially if there's a lot of side ligament injury, um, then you splint towards the side of the greater injury. And that just helps to give it uh, support from that sort of side to side motion that can be re-aggravating. Um, dorsal dislocations or when the finger, this middle knuckle dislocates out the back is the most common uh, dislocation. And this is your so-called coach's finger. So this will happen a lot in sports, come off the sideline and just pull it, pop it back in, go back and play and you're fine. Um, and what the way that these happen is again, it's the same kind of jamming force. It's just, it's just more severe. So it gets hyperextended, bent backward, tears this, and then it gets popped out the back. And what's pictured here is when they actually bayonet, where one gets kind of one bone gets sitted, is, uh, is sitting on top of the others. Um, but uh, uh, these often again can be uh, you know put back in at the time of injury. When it gets to that where it's this bayonet um, opposition, the the way to put it back in is a little bit you know you don't just kind of pull on it. You have to kind of hyperextend or make the deformity actually worse. So that you can kind of perch that middle phalanx sort of that concave surface on the edge of the proximal phalanx and then sort of flip it over the end. Um, but again, if you uh, if you do that, you've got to get an x-ray uh, to make sure that there's not a fracture. Um, but if there isn't and they're stable, I splint them in a little bit of flexion for maximum a week and then get them moving because again, they're, they have issues with the same kind of stiffness problem. Um, again, fracture dislocations when the ligament, rather than just tearing off of the bone, pulls a chunk of bone with it. These are less stable than the simple dislocations once they're put back in. And if that piece is big, they often require surgery to, to do something, fix the piece, stabilize the joint. Um, sometimes um, you can you know watch these really, really closely in a splint that holds the finger in a little bit of flexion, but these have to really be watched. Um, and I've seen a number of kids where a uh, finger got put back in at a game and, you know, thought it was fine. And then they really had one of these fracture dislocations and then it kind of slowly dislo it dislocated again. And they just didn't have quite the, you know, the normal motion come in to see me three or four weeks later. And it's, it's, it's been uh, broken and dislocated for several weeks. And then those need surgery. But again, sometimes if you catch them and they're properly splinted and watched, uh, closely, sometimes you can splint them like this and treat them that way. Um, a traumatic boutonniere is uh, is kind of an odd mimicker. It'll look like a PIP or a middle knuckle sprain, but it won't be. And the difference is that what happens in this type of injury is actually you tear the attachment of this part of the extensor tendon. So the, the part of the extensor tendon that allows you to pull your middle knuckle up, it's called the central slip, that gets torn off but you still have some supporting structures along the side that allow you to extend the end knuckle. So you get this, it's called a boutonniere, where you get flexion through the middle knuckle, but then hyperextension through the end knuckle. So if the finger's starting to, to form a posture like this, this boutonniere may be what's going on. And those are treated uh, differently. Um, rather than early motion, these actually do need to get splinted. So um, the, the, the middle knuckle gets splinted in extension, and then you work on what are called lateral band exercises, where you work on flexion ex exercises of that hyperextended end knuckle. Now, talking about the thumb, uh, gamekeeper's thumb is worth mentioning. It's actually more appropriately called skier's thumb based on how these usually happen. And they usually happen with a fall and then the thumb gets sort of bent backwards or to the side and um, and you tear the, the, the part of the ligament that helps to support here uh, on the sort of inside of the thumb at where it joins the hand. And that's the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb. And the reason that's important is that if you want to pinch, you really need this ligament to work for you because otherwise the thumb will just mm, kind of go off to the side if you don't have that good ligament of support. Um, MRI is helpful in these because it can help distinguish, um, especially if your exam is a little bit unclear, whether it's uh, simply stretched or whether it's completely torn. And in some cases, a completely torn ligament uh, can end up buttonholing or sort of flipping on the outside of a layer of muscle. And then that layer of muscle sits between the ligament and where it belongs on the bone. And so the ligament in those what are called stenor lesions are not 
uh, is not able to reattach properly and those all need surgery. And to be honest, uh, for most acute complete tears of this ligament, I recommend surgery. It's so predictable. We now have this internal brace that got kind of uh, popularized when Drew Brees had this injury, uh, and uh, with that, we really can um, can get you know people back to sports fairly quickly after such an injury. Next, I want to talk about scaphoid fracture. So the scaphoid is one of the small bones of the wrist. It is a very common fracture, especially in young male football players, and it'll often happen in the middle of the season, and the kids will say, oh, like it's, it's just not that bad. It's just probably a sprain because nobody wants to get pulled out of the game or pulled out of the sport, um, and so they are easily missed because sometimes they really actually don't hurt that bad. Um, but the problem with these fractures is that um, it, they'll take, even on a good day, they'll take a long time to heal. And sometimes they won't heal at all. And if they're not properly treated and they don't start to heal, then part of the bone can die, which is called avascular necrosis. And then uh, unfortunately what'll happen is that you'll get a very predictable form of arthritis in the wrist. And you get arthritis in the wrist in a 22 year old, I and mean, that's, that's a hard problem to sort of treat. Um, so any kid who's had a fall, and they're complaining of thumb-sided wrist pain, uh, in my opinion, that's a scaphoid fracture until you can prove that it's not. And again, they'll have tenderness in what's called the anatomic snuff box, which is this area right here where your thumb joins the wrist. Um, these happen with the classic fall onto an outstretched tan. Uh, and if you think that someone might have this, it's worth splinting them in, in a thumb spike, a splint, or a wrist splint. Um, uh, x-rays, uh, even if you do repeat x-rays, sometimes they'll miss it. So if there's any concern, I get an MRI. Um, these are, here's a, here's an x-ray where you can actually clearly see what's called a non-displaced. So it's broken, but it's not shifted. Scaphoid waist fracture. So it's broken kind of in the middle of the bone. Um, here's a similar, uh, you know, kind of fracture, but just visual, visualize on the MRI here to the right. The problem with these fractures is that the blood supply is a bit tricky. It is only one blood vessel that enters in at the end of the bone, the distal or the sort of thumb side of the bone is where the blood vessel comes in. And um, at the farther away you get from that blood flow, um, the farther away the fracture is, the less likely it is to heal. And that's sort of evidence on this diagram here. So if you have a break at the at that, at that end that's near, at the end of the bone that's near the thumb. And again, this thing's shaped kind of like a little twisted peanut. So if you get it on the end of the peanut that's next to the thumb, great, those are gonna heal fine. You get it on the other end of the peanut that's next to the, uh, the radius of the wrist, those have a much, much, much less likelihood of healing. Um, so just to summarize how we treat these, any fracture of the scaphoid that's displaced or shifted or just not properly aligned, those all need surgery. Um, the what are called proximal pole fractures, so the ones that are farther away from the blood flow, uh, those all need surgery. Um, those that are right next to the blood flow, the distal ones, what are called tubercle fractures, and those are kind of right up next to the base of the thumb, those just need a splint or a cast. Then the ones in the middle, what are called the waist fractures, if they are truly non-displaced, it's kind of dealer's choice. They can be casted or they can be operated on. And really those are kind of, those are up to the patient. Um, I, we've, there's been a trend and I lean towards fixing these because it's such a, it's so much faster to get um, kids back uh, playing sports and to get adults back at work. Um, because even on a good day, when you catch them right away, they can require three to four months to heal. So you're talking sometimes three to four months in a cast. Um, whereas if I put a screw in and I can do that through a fairly small incision, um, and, uh, you know, and it's, if it's non-displaced, it's pretty simple to slide the screw in. And, uh, if the screw's there, then you sometimes, um, don't need a cast or just certainly don't need a cast for as long as you would otherwise. So, um, although the, the chances of healing in both treatment options are quite good and over 95%, um, the ability to get back to sports faster is, uh, is, is the case with the screw. So. Um, another uh, small bone on the wrist that can get injured in sports is the hamate. So the hook of the hamate is sort of protrudes in the uh, pinky side of this fleshy part of your hand. And it happens in racket or club sports where you hit something hard. You think about hitting a golf club uh, or a golf, uh, hitting a, a golf shot fat. Um, and the racket 
strikes that part of your hand and can knock the hook or the little point of this fracture off or this bone off. And, and here's an example of a CT scan. X-rays are really hard. Sometimes you don't catch them on an X-ray. It's uncommon to. Um, and so if there's concern there, if they're tender there and the story's right, I'll get a CT scan and that'll often catch it. Um, and thankfully, the treatment's pretty straightforward and the recovery's pretty fast. All we have to do is take the hook out and we can take it out without really any major you know, issues with uh, function in the hand at all. Um, and once the incision's healed, they can get back to activity pretty much as tolerated. Uh, lastly, um, just a word about the TFCC. So this is a super complicated structure. It exists on this pinky side of the wrist. It helps to support your rotational joints. So this palm up, palm down, rotational joint of the wrist and forearm, the TFCC helps to kind of hold that in place. Um, and it can um, it can tear with a rotational injury. So if you can imagine if you're like using a drill and then it binds and twists, uh, twists the wrist, that's one way to tear it. It can also get torn with just a basic fall. Uh, they can be associated with another wrist fracture or they can just happen by themselves. Um, and sometimes this will behave kind of like a wrist sprain that doesn't really get better. And uh, and they can also have some, what are called DRUJ, and that's that's talking about the, again, that swivel joint between these two bones here. Um, they can have symptoms like clicking or catching or just problems with rotation. Thankfully, most of these tears heal on their own and how we treat them really depends on how stable uh, that swivel joint is. So we test that by moving your ulna kind of back and forth uh, next to the radius. It's called a piano key test. And it, um, it, uh, it allows us to know um, how stable those two bones are. And it's always important to compare it to the other side. If that joint is not stable, then we tend to go towards surgery. Um, if it is, and most of them are, um, it's the typical rest splint. Sometimes we'll do injections, um, but these can take several months also to sort of get better. Um, so just to summarize, uh, when is it uh, a good idea to seek further treatment or to refer someone? Again, anything you put back in place, um, any concern for a tendon injury, especially for a flexor tendon injury. And if you think you have a flexor tendon injury, you need to push to get evaluated as soon as possible. Uh, any concern for a scaphoid fracture. So thumb sided wrist pain and someone who's had a fall, um, those need to get looked at. Um, if you've got a lot of point tenderness over bone, especially with bruising, any kind of uh, differences in stability or deformity that needs to get looked at. And uh, anything, that, any pain or motion that's really not like starting to get better uh, over a week or two really needs to get looked at. So uh, thanks so much for uh, letting me uh, chat with you guys tonight. And, and I am here and happy to answer any questions that you may have about uh, athletic injuries of the hand. Thanks so much.